Welcome back. Uh, last time we looked at how we can join uh, monomers together, monomers being things like uh, simple sugars like glucose or amino acids or nucleotides, how we can join those molecules together to form complex organic polymers. And it's those organic polymers which are often used to construct um, cells. Um, so what we'll look at today is um, the first of the, the major macromolecule groups, and that's, that's carbohydrates. Um, and so we'll look at some simple sugars, then we'll look at some more complicated sugars uh, called polysaccharides, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about structure and function to the end. So let's start off really simple. Here are some simple sugars, and these are probably pretty familiar to you. Uh, so we've got galactose, glucose, and fructose there, and these are all examples of hexose sugars. Now when you look at fructose, it, it may seem a little odd that that's a hexose sugar because it's only a five-membered ring. It's only got five sides. It's, a, it's, a, it's basically a little pentagon. Um, but when we talk about a hexose sugar, what we're talking about is the number of carbons. So hex means six. So galactose, glucose, and fructose are three examples of sugars that have six carbons. And the carbons here are arranged into a ring. So they're an example of how carbon, due to its valence of four, can be assembled into a ring. And so if you look at these, let's start with galactose. We've got uh, one carbon here. And remember, uh, in, in organic chemistry, when you draw a bend in a line like this, uh, that's a carbon. And we know there's a carbon there as well because it's making four bonds, one up to the oxygen here, one down to the hydrogen here, up to the left of the oxygen, and down to the left to another carbon here. So there's one carbon, two, three, four, five, and then six. You can count the same in glucose, a little bit different in, in fructose. One here, uh, two, uh, let's actually start them up here. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, and then six over here. So numbered as one, two, three, uh, four, five, six. So those are the six in fructose. Took me a minute to find the sixth one, but clearly six, six uh, carbons. So um, we'll talk about the, the function of these. Right now you're just looking at, at uh, uh, some examples of some simple sugars, and we're going to use those to build more complicated structures called polysaccharides. Uh, but before we go on, uh, I want us to consider a quick question. And it's going, to be, it's going to be about solubility. Now, you know that if you take glucose or you take fructose or you take sucrose, which is table sugar, and you put them in water, they dissolve. And so all of these molecules here will dissolve in water. So the thing I want you to think about is what chemical properties of the bonds in these molecules allow them to dissolve? Now remember, dissolving means that water will form a hydration shell around a molecule. So what characteristics of the bonds, and we've talked about polar and non-polar covalent bonds, so what characteristics of those bonds um, can you see in these molecules that would allow these simple sugars to dissolve? So here comes a question. Let's see how you do. Okay, so let's just talk about this one very quickly. Um, looking at the glucose molecule below, which bonds contribute its ability to dissolve in water? So um, think back to a discussion we had about polarity, and, and this is going to be this first example of, of how understanding polarity and electronegativity is critical um, as you move forward. And if you try to dismiss that and ignore it, this is where you're going to start to struggle. So um, a non-polar covalent bond would be between two atoms of equal electronegativity, like between two hydrogens in hydrogen gas, or between two carbons, um, or between two oxygens in oxygen gas. So let's look to see if there are any uh, non-polar covalent bonds, and, and there certainly are. Uh, this carbon here on the left, carbon-4, is forming a bond up to a hydrogen. And remember, carbon and hydrogen are about the same electronegativity, so the electrons are going to be pulled equally between the carbon, a carbon-4, and the hydrogen, so that bond is going to be non-polar. And so non-polar things don't dissolve because you can't surround them with a shell of water. Remember, to dissolve something, you've got to form a shell of water. That means that either the electronegative oxygen's got to point towards uh, a polar part of the molecule, or the hydrogen's got to point towards a differently polar part of the molecule. So that carbon-hydrogen bond there doesn't contribute. Neither does this carbon-carbon bond here. But if you think back to our discussion on water and what makes that polar, it's the, it's the polar covalent bonds. So those are any bonds that form between a molecule which is highly electronegative 
and a molecule which is less electronegative. So between, for example, oxygen and hydrogen, or carbon and oxygen, for example. So let's look at this. There's an oxygen-hydrogen bond between this O and this H. There's a, there's a, there's a polar covalent bond between this C and this O. Um, there's a polar covalent bond between the carbon-4 and this oxygen down here, and between this oxygen and this hydrogen. So you're looking for a lot of OH bonds. If a molecule has a lot of OH bonds, it's going to be relatively polar. It's going to have parts which are polar, and that means that the water molecules can form a shell around it. And uh, in the case of the of the oxygen down here, um, the electropositive hydrogens of a water molecule would point towards the oxygen. They could have a weak electrostatic interaction there. And so all of the OH bonds here would contribute to this molecule dissolving in water. So C is the answer there. Uh, here's another one. Let's see how you get on with this. Okay, so what have we got here? We've got a molecule which is composed entirely of carbon and hydrogen. And so all of the bonds that you find here, whether the carbon-carbon or the carbon-hydrogen bonds, are nonpolar. That means that they can't form any hydrogen bonds with, with anything else, um, and they certainly can't form hydrogen bonds with water. So that means this would not dissolve in water. Now you could put it in oil, an oily substance and it would it would dissolve um, and we're not going to get into why that happens, but, but this won't dissolve in water because there are no polar covalent bonds. So this wouldn't dissolve at all, so um, B is the right answer there. Okay, let's move on and, um, and increase a little complexity here. So simple sugars are then arranged into uh, more complex sugars. Now the first level of complexity is a disaccharide. Um, so uh, that's, that's two monosaccharides stuck together, so the common example is sucrose. Two sugars stuck together. Um, a lot of the same properties that you see in monosaccharides. Then the complexity comes when we get to joining many of these sugars together. So what you're looking at here is a short piece of a molecule called starch, which you're familiar with. You're familiar with starch as in potatoes and rice and, and those kinds of things, starchy foods. So starch is a branched polysaccharide. And if you look at glycogen, like glycogen, uh, which is your storage polysaccharide, and this starch is a plant's storage polysaccharide. If you look at glycogen, it is really, really highly branched. And we'll talk about the relationship between structure and function in a moment. But um, these are branched polysaccharides. So this is this is starch. So um, all that's happened here is that we've used condensation chemistry, which we talked about before. That's where you take two monomers and you join them together using some chemistry and you release a water molecule. So we've used condensation chemistry here to join these individual glucose molecules, which are kind of shaded in purple, together. And so we've got a bit of a chain going on at the top here, and then there's a, a branching connection here, and there's another chain at the bottom, and there would be chains uh, branching off all over the place on, on this starch. Uh, not as much as glycogen, but still some pretty extensive branching. And so when we form this bond here between, for example, the one carbon on this glucose on the left and this four carbon on this glucose on the right, that's called a glycosidic bond. Uh, and there's another glycosidic bond here. This is a 1,6 bond because it's between the one carbon of this glucose at the top and the six carbon of this glucose at the bottom. So this is called a 1,4 glycosidic bond, and this is a 1,6 glycosidic bond. Now, you don't have to recognize these, um, except in as much as if I show you two sugars joined together, you should be able to, to tell me that it's a glycosidic bond. So as we start looking at these organic polymers, and we look at proteins and nucleic acids, and those kinds of things. There's, there's some trends in what you want to look for. First of all, what is the monomer? So what is the basic building block? Here it's glucose, which is a simple sugar. Secondly, um, how do I join the monomers together? And that's always going to be condensation. How do I break the, the polymer down? That's always going to be hydrolysis, which we talked about last time. Um, what is the structure function relationship in the polymer? We'll talk about that later. And then what kind of bond is formed? And these, these are covalent bonds that have special names when I join two monomers together or when I form a chain. So here, it's a glycosidic bond. So we've got the monomer is glucose. Condensation chemistry is used to build up the polymer that's a polysaccharide. Hydrolysis is used to break it down. Um, we'll talk about structure function relationships in a moment. And then lastly, you form these glycosidic bonds. Here are one four glycosidic bond, and here are one six glycosidic bond. Okay, so this, here's another, here's another, um, uh, polysaccharide. This is, um, this is cellulose, and cellulose is just long 
chains of polymerized glucose. It's just long and dead straight. Um, and so uh, again here, structure will reflect function. Now, I'm not going to tell you the specific structure function relationship here. I want you to read about that. I want you to Google it. I want you to have a, have, have a look at uh, what is the structure and function relationship. It ultimately comes down to the chemical properties of the individual glucose molecules and, and that is going to connect back to hydrogen bonding. So uh, I'll probably put a writing assignment in for you to explore that idea, the structure function relationship in these, in these polysaccharides. Uh, last thing we'll look at, um, uh, this is glycogen and you can see a little bit more branch than the starch we looked at. Um, and so same kind of principle, we've got glycosidic bonds joining the monomers which are glucose together there's a 1,4 there and a 1,6 here more branching hydrolysis breaks this molecule down um, condensation builds it up the monomers of glucose and there's a structure function relationship so what are the structure function relationships well you've seen the structures and we have a couple of functions first of all energy, energy storage. So glucose is a energy rich molecule. Also carbon storage as well though. So these, these molecules store carbon because they contain carbon. So if you need carbon to build something else, you can take the carbon from glucose um, and you can use that in another molecule. You break the glucose down and you use that to make something else. Um, Cellulose is a structural molecule. So we've got cellulose being involved in structure. It's found in plant cell walls. Uh, we've got energy storage, simple sugars. We've got glycogen, which is your long, longer term store of energy before we get into, into fats. And then we've got carbon storage. So here are uh, three functions. And is what you need to do is go and look online and, um, and find out what the relationship between structure and function is. Why is cellulose used in plant cell walls? Why is glycogen used for storage? Why is starch used for storage? What is the relationship between the structure of the molecule and the function? So the key word is the relationship. There's two words, I guess. The key is the relationship. Okay, you don't just describe the structure and then describe the function. You've got to show how one relates to the other. Okay, so I'm gonna leave you with that. Uh, that's all we're gonna do in this short video. And uh, next time, we'll look at a different organic polymer.